Majestic Oil versus Lloyd's uh, of London. Ms. Mary. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Victoria Mary, and I represent the appellant, Majestic Oil. We appeal from a district court that was determined to grant summary judgment in favor of Lloyd's in this case. The district court inverted the summary judgment standards, indulged all inferences in favor of Lloyd's, and excluded or ignored evidence that the plaintiff could use to survive summary judgment. Specifically, the district court erred in three ways. First, the district court granted summary judgment on concurrent causation, finding that uh, Majestic Oil had failed to provide evidence allocating the damage of Hurricane Harvey, despite record evidence from lay witnesses and experts um, allocating sole causation of the loss of the roof to Hurricane Harvey. Second, the district court struck key causation evidence from Majestic Oil's causation expert, Greg Becker, finding his affidavit was a sham. And finally, the district court disallowed Becker to supplement his opinions to rule out an earlier storm that uh, the district court then relied on in saying, well, you didn't rule this out. You can't just point to Harvey. I'm granting summary judgment. So I'll take each point. Regarding summary judgment, Texas Supreme Court case law is clear. Under Lyons versus Millers, circumstantial evidence is sufficient to support a verdict uh, under co uh, on concurrent causation. In Lyons, there were lay witnesses who said there was no damage to their property before a storm, and following the storm, there was ample damage. That was sufficient to uphold the jury verdict for the plaintiff in that case, even though the plaintiff's expert had said, well, it's actually likely there could have been these other causes, we're not sure. The Texas Supreme Court said that's good enough. That is some evidence that the cause of the loss was a covered peril. In that case, it was a storm. Counsel, do you agree that Texas law on the question of concurrent causation is somewhat in flux? I agree that it is somewhat in flux, but I think that the quantum of evidence required is not. And well, I should, we, should we certify the question? You know, it's been certified twice by this court, and the Texas Supreme Court keeps trying to answer the question, but, but everybody keeps settling. Um, and so there were certified questions pending, I guess, when the briefing was done, but should we do the same thing here? I mean, is that dispositive for this appeal, or how do we get around that? No, Your Honor. I think this case is much more similar to the advanced indicator case that actually came out yesterday, yeah. in which this court said, we don't need to certify. We know this is a slightly muddled area of law, but given this summary judgment record and what the district court did in granting summary judgment, by the way, that was also a Hurricane Harvey claim in the same district court, um, we can reverse. This needs to go back. There's clearly a fact issue. So your reading of the advance indicator case is basically could be concurrent, could be sole cause. It's a jury question. I mean, is it that broad or is it more restricted than that? No, I think advanced indicator, like this case, is a sole cause case. And I think the, the panel was saying in advance indicator, yes, there is evidence that suggests wear and tear, deferred maintenance, whatever else the insurance company wants to present. But there is also evidence from the plaintiff allocating the sole cause to Harvey. And that is this case. And that is a jury's province to determine not the district court. The district court should not be making credibility determinations or weighing our evidence. We just want a jury to be able to look at everything, look at the evidence of a four-day storm of biblical proportions pummeling the Houston area and destroying a roof. And then if Lloyds wants to come into court and say, well, it was a bad roof, they're welcome to do that. But we'd like a jury to make that determination. So getting back to what the evidence... Let me, let me ask you a factual question. What was the explanation for why the expert didn't know the velocity of the wind within a mile? Apparently, that's what caused him to change his mind. Is that right? 
I, I, I think you're referring to the supplemental opinion, Judge right. Clement? Okay, so what Becker supplemented his report to say is he found, subsequent to issuing his report, he found weather data that showed a tornado with winds up to 90 miles per hour within half, a half mile of the property in this case. And he said, based on that, there is no question that the January storm was not a contributor. Now, this is not actually dispositive in our view because what Becker actually has said consistently in his first report, in his affidavit, is that based on talking to the owners, inspecting the roof, looking at the weather data, Hurricane Harvey is more likely than not the cause of the, data, of the damage, the failure of the roof that he observed at the property. So it's but, not but, in... But let me interrupt you back to Judge Clement's question, though. Why didn't he get the data earlier? It was available. <clears throat> All I can say to that, Your Honor, is it was created for a different case, and unfortunately, he did not incorporate it into... Well, I mean, it, it struck me in the record as one of those kind of light bulb case, uh, cases where, you know, he's going through another case, and he comes across the data, and he says, oh my gosh, this relates to this case, too. But, but the problem is, is it's untimely, right? Well, even if it is untimely, Judge Wilson, um, the district court totally failed to consider all the factors and sanctioning the exclusion of this evidence, right? So, okay, I, I'll go with you and say, perhaps it was untimely. Perhaps Becker should have supplemented with that data earlier. Uh, but at the time he supplemented, there was no trial date. There was no scheduling order. There were no deadlines. And in fact, expert discovery was ongoing. Um, Becker supplemented as soon as he realized it was relevant. But again, that's just one factor. There are four. The district court did not consider those. And Judge Duncan, you wrote in Lloyd's versus Acts on Pressure, you reversed because the district court failed to consider the four factors in making a determination that critical expert evidence should be excluded as untimely. We just don't have that information from the court. What did the district court say here in excluding the uh, supplemental report? The district court, in a very perfunctory opinion, said, the data's not new, okay. Um, it was available. His failure to acquire it is not grounds to supplement after the deadline. Um, his own delay to seemingly surprise Lloyd's at his deposition by altering his ultimate conclusion is not harmless. That's the entirety of his analysis. Um, as I recall in the Axon case, um, the one that I wrote, uh, well, you can refresh my recollection. It's been a couple terms. Um, the district court there just said nothing in excluding the uh, expert report? So, Your Honor, there were actually two orders in that case. Uh, there's two parts of your opinion that you reversed on both, actually. And one, he said nothing, and you said, this is just an abuse of discretion. We've got to send this back. But then the second part, he did have a couple of sentences saying, well, this doesn't really seem to change too much. I don't think it's important. Exclude it, basically. And I just remember that the, the orders were very, very sparse. They were, and I, frankly, I, I think they're quite similar to the one we have here. And, and this actually... But, but if the court just applied the first factor, it's untimely, and there's no excuse for why it's untimely, is that enough to surmount the abuse of discretion standard of review? No, Your Honor. I mean, the court doesn't have to reflexively go through and recite all four factors, right? They don't, they don't have to go through and analyze each one expressly, right? Or do they? Well, I disagree with that. I think under Fifth Circuit precedent, the court does need to consider the factors. I'm not saying he has to mention them specifically in exactly the way that they're set out by this court, but it's clear that he has not considered at least two out of the four factors, including the importance of the testimony. That is a very weighty factor. That's a factor that this court has used to say in Betzel and other cases, look, this evidence is critical. And that's exactly what Judge Hughes said in this case. He said causation is the key issue in this case. Those were his words. But then he's excluding evidence that he believes would help the burden, would help the plaintiff survive summary judgment. And the other factors are the prejudice to Lloyd's. He doesn't really talk about that. I mean, he says we've surprised them. But again, this supplement was in April. 
no trial date at that time the ultimate trial date that was set was in october there was plenty of time to do any supplemental discovery if requested which they never did request it because they asked becker tons of questions about this supplemental opinion at his deposition well they didn't have the supplemental opinion at the deposition right the the supplement the supplement came out i guess post deposition he he sort of disclosed these new opinions in the deposition as they were examining him right that's correct and the final factor on this supplement is the possibility for a continuance to cure any prejudice again lloyds didn't ask there was no trial date and the district court didn't even consider it the district court simply went with the most strict possible sanction for this and excluded our evidence despite all that we still think this court can reverse based on the evidence that was properly or probably should have been in the summary judgment record because becker never said the january 2017 storm caused the damage what he said is it may have contributed that's a possibility that's not a likelihood and then he went on to say however my assessment after talking to the owners about the leaks that only appeared after harvey which was in august of 2017 is that harvey is more likely than not the cause of the damage but doesn't that take us right back to the to the question under texas law of concurrent causation and what the plaintiff's burden is under texas law to exclude non-covered perils in other words, if we just say first report only, put the evidentiary rulings aside, they, they stay out, you're saying that summary judgment was still improper because there's enough there because he, he did say more likely than not it was Harvey. That might survive for summary judgment if Texas law is not, you plaintiff have to exclude all non-covered perils. Well, I would just say that advanced indicator has told us that we don't have to exclude all non-covered pairs. There's remarkably similar arguments in that case. This is an old roof, wear and tear, deferred maintenance. Well, in advanced indicator, you said there is some evidence such that a jury could allocate damages. And that's all that's required under lions and fees. Is there anything similar? I mean, I know advanced indicator states that there were some affidavits struck, I guess, some expert affidavits. I mean similar situation or can we tell from the t from that case in this one uh i, I couldn't have, tell it just seemed to be noted i've reviewed the record and I, I do want to point out to the court that the advanced indicator decision that came out last night said we're not even going to consider those affidavits we don't even have to reach the issue of whether those were properly right. struck um, so they did that based on like i said a very similar record um, i believe they were struck on a different basis but I also believe that there was a very outcome determinative process to get to where the district court wanted on that case, just as there is in this case. And that is striking or ignoring summary judgment evidence that allows the plaintiff to meet its burden um, so that the district court could grant summary judgment. And I, I think these two cases are quite similar. What about damages? I mean, you, your damages expert says, here's what it costs to repair the roof. Th th that estimate doesn't have anything to do with whether Harvey caused it or the January storm caused it or whether wear and tear caused it. He just says, that here's what it is. Is that enough to survive summary judgment? Well, Your Honor, so I disagree that it doesn't have to do with Harvey because what point... Well, I'm just, no, no, I'm not saying it does or doesn't. I'm saying that, 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 your, that your damages expert who says, here's what it costs to repair the roof, says i didn't determine whether it's harvey or whatever here's this is what's wrong with the roof this is what has to be done but is that enough to sustain a claim related to harvey yes because the jury just sorts out how much is or isn't based on becker's report or i mean how does that work no so the loss here this is not a question of whether there were some missing bricks on the roof prior to harvey this is not a question of whether there was some wear and tear. Any roof in South Texas has more than its fair share of wear and tear. And I, I will just point the panel quickly in the record. There is also ample evidence that my client spent $25,000 repairing the roof just a year and a half before Harvey. So this notion that it's you know a totally dilapidated roof is just not accurate at all. 
But to answer your question, Your Honor, and I know I'm short for time, what Becker said is this Harvey has caused total failure of the roof. It must be replaced. So when Pointer comes in and says this is the cost to replace the roof, that is enough because that is the loss that was caused by Harvey, requiring full replacement. Thank you, Counsel. You have time for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wilkin. May it please the Court. My name is Bruce Wilkin. I'm here on behalf of Underwriters at Lloyd's London. This Court can affirm this judgment for two independent reasons, damages and causation. Both are essential elements of the plaintiff's claim in this case. And under both elements, essential elements, damages, the dollar and cents that they're trying to get under the insurance policy, and under causation, what are the causes of loss to the damages on the roof up at the Majestic Oil. Either ground is sufficient, and under both respects, the plaintiff has failed to allocate in this case. So therefore, that is judgment in favor of the insurer. I would submit that the Court should address damages first, as Judge Wilson was pointing out, because if you agree with Lloyd's on the damages front, you get to the end of your opinion quicker. You don't need to get into all the procedural machinations of Becker trying to change his opinion with his late report and all those sorts of things. Looking solely at Pointer, okay, damages, that's the damages expert, Mr. Pointer, okay. So, of course, allocation applies in this case because this is a real case in the real world, right. This isn't an academic exercise. This isn't a law review article. Where are we heading at the end of this? We're heading to a judgment, and a judgment will be very specific, dollars and cents to the penny. And, of course, a judgment in a case on an insurance policy, those dollars and cents have to be for items and causes of loss that are covered by the policy, and those dollars and cents cannot include things that the policy does not cover. But, Counsel, so you're describing a very elegant jury question. So how do you deal with advanced indicator, which does seem, as I read it pretty quickly, you've got to love it when the court hands down a case directly related to yours the day before argument. But it seems to say, well, here there's enough evidence that a jury could say solely caused by Harvey and therefore plaintiff wins, so summary judgment wasn't proper. Isn't that the case here? That is not the case here. How so? So to begin, I have not seen advanced indicator. I did not see that come out last night, and so I can't speak to that case specifically. I will go back and look at that immediately after this. I was not aware a new case came out last night. In this case, there is no expert that has come in and said, here's the evidence that the sole damage in the case is from Hurricane Harvey. In fact, it's the opposite, okay? You know, under the general gatekeeping function that any court applies, right, federal rule of evidence 104E, 702C, if an expert is going to come in and say sole causation, sole damage is from X, this cause over here, what do we require the expert to do? The expert has to show his homework, right? Under 702C, what is your reliable methodology that you have said, okay, I want to say it's Harvey, but there's all this other evidence out there that is contributing to the damage up there. We have that from their own engineer, Mr. Heinrichs, who showed up two months after Harvey. We have pre-Harvey evidence from all the roofers saying this roof needs to be replaced. We have evidence from the adjuster, Mr. Lunt, a nationally respected adjuster after Harvey. We have evidence also after Harvey of another engineer, Mr. Barbuto, also pointing out non-Harvey, non-covered items that are contributing to the damages up there. Mr. Becker, well, frankly, both Mr. Becker and Mr. Pointer failed to address any of the items discussed by Heinrichs, 
by Hamill when she was discussing all the roofers, saying this needs to be replaced, by what Mr. Lunt pointed out, and what the, the second engineer before Becker, what Mr. Barbudo, right, two engineers, Heinrichs and Barbudo, what they pointed out as non-covered contributing to the damage up there. So, to the question, why is this not a sole causation case? Mr. Expert, 702C, show me your homework. Where, where is Mr. Becker's reliable methodology to say, I am aware of what Heinrich said, what Hamill said, what Lunt said, what Barbudo said, and here is my reliable methodology of how I'm ruling those out as contributing to the damage up here, and therefore, here is how I can say it is only Harvey. This case is the opposite. Mr. Becker admitted, I wasn't asked to do that. You know, you might recall in their opening brief, they said, well, don't hold us to the allocation standard because that wasn't his assignment. Well, that's our whole point. <laughs> Mr. Becker didn't do that. In fact, in the deposition testimony, he was unaware of that other stuff. He was just asked to talk about Harvey. Could Harvey have contributed to the, to the damage? Okay, here's another way to say it. Simply proving or, or not even proving, let me just say it this way, simply putting forth an expert report that says Harvey could have caused some of the damage does not prove that it caused all of the damage. It doesn't do anything to rule out the other causes. But if they, if they put forth the first, the first report, let's be concrete about it. Yes. The expert says more likely than not, or th this was caused by Harvey. Mm -hmm. Can't exclude that this January storm contributed to roof vulnerability. Right, which defeats like their case, yes. All right. Does a plaintiff under Texas law have to, have to exclude every possible non-covered peril or, or damages related to a non-covered peril to show that some or bulk or most of the damage was caused by a covered peril? Uh, yes, yes. The, and, but, but here's the key, okay? And this maybe goes to your certified question. Uh, question to, to counsel. Uh, there has to be evidence of that, okay? Um, I think what, where we've gotten into some issues in this area of the law is that on the outer edges, frankly, you've had some insurance companies coming in and saying, well, conceptually, wear and tear is out there every time, right? We all went to physics class, and under the basic rules of entropy, the day that that building was done being built, it started to wear and tear. So allocate every time. Every case is an allocation case. And I think the questions that the Fifth Circuit has been asking the Texas Supreme Court is, really, is every case really an allocation case? And probably not. Okay. You, so do you, you, you agree with your, your friend on the other side that we should not certify? Yeah, I, I don't think you should certify this case. And, and here's why. Freimeyer and Overstreet they really were playing at the outer edges, particularly Freimeyer, because it was, the, the, the Freimeyer argument was, well, wear and tear is out there every time, so you gotta allocate every time. Um, but there was no evidence in the case of wear and tear contributing to the damages at issue in the case. And that's a key difference here, okay? And here's another point on the certified question. Okay, allocation has been around for over a half century in Texas law. Right? Nobody, even on the policyholder side, is arguing allocation should go away or allocation should just be wiped off the map. Okay? It, uh, so some cases are allocation cases. And I would submit that this case is an allocation case. This one is just right down the middle. This is like Lowen Valley in 2018, uh, Judge Clement, that you were on, where, and, and the difference, what's the difference between this case and Freimeyer is the evidence. Okay? What we have in this case is evidence from their own engineer, Mr. Heinrichs, talking about there is a defective roof slope going on out there, there are uh, improper drainage lines, and there are also, literally the roof is, has separation from the brick, there's cracks in the cement. Heinrichs is the one who came out when they were buying the property? No, he was the one- Heinrichs the one that came right after Harvey? Exactly, okay. two months after Harvey their own guy. And what he talked about, all those sorts of things are contributing to the damage up there. Okay, that's, that's uh, record on appeal site tw uh, 1216. Then in his deposition, you might recall, 
uh, this is uh, record sites 1208 to 09, where we went through photo after photo with Mr. Heinrichs saying, well, what about this? What about that? And he's saying, yeah, that's not Harvey. That's, you know, that's older pre-existing damage. That's not Harvey. That's not Harvey. So you have their own guy. There's evidence in the record saying there are other issues going on there that's contributing to the loss, okay? You also have the evidence pre-Harvey of all the roofers saying this 70-year-old roof needs to be replaced because of all the issues going on here. Post-Harvey, you have nationally respected adjuster Mr. Lunt pointing out you know, improper repair, deterioration. You have another engineer come in and talk about other construction defects and other mechanical damage on this roof, all contributing to the damage. But don't you, always, don't you also have uh, testimony that it wasn't leaking before Harvey? You can't just disregard that. No, it's not disregarded, okay? But just because they went up and, and put a couple of Band-Aids on it before the storm doesn't mean that that, that damage is, is magically disappearing, has magically disappeared. And I think what illustrates that the best, frankly, is what their own engineer, Mr. Heinrichs, post-Harvey, still saw as conditions on the roof that are contributing to the damage being claimed. Okay, and, and so specifically to your question, does an insured have to come in and just, gosh, do we have to allocate absolutely everything that, uh, you know, do we have to get the list of every exclusion in the policy and have an have engineer's report it, rule them all out? No, okay? The only ones they need to rule out is when there is evidence that some of these exclusions are in play, and those are the ones that Texas law says the burden is on the insured that needs to be carved out, okay? And what do we have here? We have uh, we, we have the defective roof slope, which of course, this, so remember, Harvey was not a wind event in Houston, okay? It was a rain event, okay? Uh, at this property, the winds were like 35 miles an hour, 36 miles an hour. This was a rain inundation issue at this property, okay? Um, and and so when you have a rain inundation issue, they said, oh, a bunch of Harvey rain, that caused new leaks, okay? But when you have things like defective roof slopes, when you have improper drainage lines that are contributing right to the inundation of this roof over time, when you have literal cracks and separation in the roof from the, from the walls and, and, and the cement, those are contributing to the damage, right? That's what concurrent causation is. We have concurrent causes, right? Some of it, maybe Harvey, but some of it is these other issues up there. And it cannot be reasonably disputed that there is copious amounts of evidence, evidence in this case, of other causes that are contributing to the damage up there, right? So if you come in and say, I want everything, Texas law says you have to carve out the portions that are not being caused by Harvey, covered peril, but are being caused by these non-covered causes, improper construction, you know, uh, uh, improper maintenance, that sort of thing. And frankly, in this case, um, Becker's first report, which, you know, admits the farm away, right? He says, yeah, there's this other, form, uh, this other storm from 2017 that I can't rule out, right? I mean, that's... Well, he didn't rule it out. That's not exactly what he said. He said that it, it can't be excluded as possibly co contributing to root vulnerability, but he said that it was more likely than not caused by Harvey. And, and back to Judge Clement's point, you got evidence that it wasn't leaking before and it was leaking after and something happened right there between. Sure. Maybe it was the confluence and convergence of all these you know, non-covered perils, but maybe, and what the expert says, is more probably it's Harvey. Well, he says more The other thing I guess it, it's worth noting to some degree is you guys insured the place and happily accepted premium when the roof was as it was when you went out and inspected it, what, 18 months earlier? Mm -hmm. And so you come back and say, well, sorry that it wasn't Harvey. It was all these pre-existing things. I mean... Well, we don't say it wasn't Harvey at all. But I guess that's the question. It just, it seems to me to be uh, fairly harsh to throw the thing out on summary judgment when... The plaintiffs at least offered some evidence that it was Harvey. There's obviously evidence that wasn't Harvey. That sounds like a jury question, but but maybe that's just an overly simplistic reading of the case. Yeah, well, it's, it, it can't be a jury question, and here's why: is that you know a lay jury is is not going to be empowered with some sort of um, 
savant engineering ability to say ok mr becker himself didn't even address all this stuff from mr heinrichs mr lott mr barbour though how in the world can a lay jury say oh i know mr becker didn't address these things and tell us how to carve them out but but we can a late a late jury in a in a case like this has no bill ability to do that that's why again back to your earlier discussion if you want to come in with a sole causation theory x mr expert then what do we require under seven zero to see show your homework ok how are you saying now yes does he say the words this was more likely than not harvey great but his analysis is just wholly lacking on all this other evidence from heinrichs line barbuto and others right another way to say it is i mean again allocation law in insurance it's not some nebulous concept completely disconnected from how we approach expert issues in general jurisprudence right if one were to say you know well here's my expert report that says uh the the sole problem with your arm is from something that the defendant did to you well mr medical expert you know were you aware that he had all these ongoing conditions were you aware that he was in a car wreck the day before he met the defendant were you aware that he was born with a degenerative disease of his arm just because they can hold up a report that says well i have an expert that says the sole cause is what the defendant did to you if that expert hasn't addressed these other items that's not a sole cause evidence right he hasn't ruled those out does uh, the mr becker supplemental report sufficiently show his homework to create a jury question on causation uh no for the same reasons the what happened with his second report is that uh we we uh first report deposition summary judgments once they get see the legal implications of his admissions they say oh no let's not admit the 2017 storm did everything so he says here's what i'm going to say about 2017 but what is still noticeably lacking anything about the heinrichs evidence anything about the lunt evidence anything about the barbudo evidence he's there's still a whole stack of non-covered damages non-covered causes that to this day mr becker has never even mentioned to say here's my homework here's my reliable methodology of how i am carving those things out and therefore this was solely hard okay second point to your question for the first point was yes. he cross-examined on that issue during his deposition on the other evidence uh well he was asked it was raised and to, to my my recollection and i believe this is cited in our brief i don't know the exact record set off the top of my head but to my recollection his response was he just wasn't aware of those things and in fact at record site um 1235 he admits he was not asked to allocate out all the other types of evidence and so it wasn't described to him in cross-examination to say well what about this evidence in the deposition that wasn't part of the cross-examination i it, it, it was to an it was to a degree in the sense of it was raised in the deposition at some point but his answer was i wasn't asked to look at that so if you didn't look at it you don't really go that much further in in the examination right he didn't consider it which is an expert problem um the really? second point <laughs> on the 2017 storm so if you look at what he says okay does he say the words i have now ruled out the 2017 storm the earlier storm um yes those words exist but this goes back to my show your homework um all he really shows in the report and all he really talks about when we, when we address the deposition is that harvey was a stronger storm okay saying harvey was a stronger storm does not rule out the earlier storm right that would be like if you and i got in a fight and i'm right-handed you know i'm going to cause more damage with my right hand and we can all acknowledge that but that doesn't mean that i'm not also causing damage with my left hand right harvey might have been stronger based on this you know new new evidence but that doesn't rule out really the other storm so i would say you know uh that 
you know in another sense that the reason it was excluded because on its face they were trying to say oh the lights no longer go red the light was green you know on its face he was trying to change his conclusion but if you dig into it he still didn't even do a good enough job frankly because he i'm sure he 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 tried to thread the needle because he had that damning admission. I know you just have a couple seconds. Counsel on the other side said that a decision, I think I wrote it, Axon, um, mm -hmm. said the district court didn't, didn't go through the factors, didn't provide reasons for striking the, um, the, right. the, the report affidavit. Do you agree with that or is that case distinguishable? No, I believe if, if I recall correctly, the case law is um, not that he didn't, not that a trial court is required to recite the factors and go through them explicitly like judge wilson pointed out the issue in that case was that there was no reason given right whereas here the district court pointed out um the weather data was always available right the the and, and by the way this new evidence it, new evidence is from a property over half mile away different insurance policy different yeah, property yeah, all these sorts I of understand things. thank yeah, you he laid it out he gave you reasons here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, counsel. Ms. Mary, you have five minutes for rebuttal. Um, thank you, Your Honors. I wanted to correct a couple of things that, uh, or I guess answer some questions you posed to uh, Mr. Wilkin. So he suggested that Becker changed his testimony um, at the summary judgment stage. That is simply incorrect. The supplement that one of the issues is the supplemental report that was issued in April. Summary judgment wasn't until August, so that's just not true. This weather data came up while he was preparing for his deposition, and that's why he supplemented at that time. So this was not an ambush at the summary judgment stage by any means. And we don't agree that it really changes his ultimate conclusion. Um, I know we talked about that in length in the original opening argument, but the bottom line is, all he said is, this storm that I said might have contributed, I don't think so, and here's why. I have this much more powerful evidence. But what about all the other evidence, Heinrich and the others who came and looked at the roof, that Becker doesn't really treat? You got the 2017 storm, but there's other, there is other stuff, as counsel opposite said in the record, that says this is not caused by Harvey. Well, I think that... So first of all, Heinrich never says this stuff wasn't caused by Harvey. He says, well, there's some stuff up here. In his deposition, they go back and forth about could this have been Harvey, could it not have been Harvey. He's not really a causation expert in this case. But isn't it plaintiff's burden to at least show the allocation between the non-Harvey causes and Harvey? Well, again, Your Honor, it's important to remember what is the loss here. And Becker's opinion from the beginning has been the roof requires replacement wholesale replacement, and that is based on the leaks that he linked directly to Harvey. He did that by speaking to managers at the scene who observed the links, who are some of the lay witnesses who provided evidence on summary judgment as well. All he did was he traced the links that only appeared post-Harvey from the interior to the roof. Becker actually got up on the roof, inspected it, did tactile tests, consulted NOAA data, in reaching his conclusions and determined that there were so many problems caused by Harvey that the roof was a total loss. And that's why, whether there was a loose brick over here or a missing parapet over there, doesn't really matter for this analysis because Becker is saying Harvey was such a damage to this roof that we must replace it. And that's what Pointer's damage estimate is. This is the replacement of the roof. And this is what's caused by Harvey. I also wanted to point out that um, opposing counsel suggested this was like Lowen Valley. I, I think Lowen Valley is distinguishable. In Lowen Valley, an employee noticed some damage years after it had apparently occurred, and then they sort of retrospectively try to pick a date within a policy period and say, this is the date. This is not the case here. Lay witnesses are circumstantial evidence, and we have witnesses who were in that building five days a week who said we had a functional roof for 18 months after we spent $30,000 repairing it. Lloyd's underwriter said no evidence of leaking. In 
may of two thousand and sixteen you can't ignore that evidence on summary judgment and that's what the district court did the final point i'd like to make is the january twenty seventeen storm is a little bit of a red herring because lloyd's actually insured majestic oil in january twenty seventeen the original policy was from april of twenty sixteen that's why they sent out their underwriter to do the inspection just following the major repairs that were done to the roof and continued so the policy we're talking about has always been a harvey claim because that is what is consistent with our clients observations and evidence but if we have to amend to add in the earlier policy lloyd still covered us at that time and if there are no further questions i will yield the remaining twenty seconds thank you one thing i think it probably be good to do i expect we'll get it anyway from council through it via twenty h a you need to grapple with um... advanced indicator and i would commend especially the lloyd's council pages ten eleven and twelve of the opinion particularly Thank you, Your yes. Honors. Yes, thank you, Counsel, for a well-argued case. Um, before we call the next case, as I said,